we'll have to figure it out by the time everyone leaves. I think they're going to stay there. Um, Oh, great. Okay, good. All right. So hopefully for anybody who's out there in the real world, um, they're able to hear it. Otherwise, pretty pictures. Um, so uh, multimodal neuroimaging, um, they're, the, they're really uh, two great questions, which is why and how. Um, and uh, they, they both really are in completely separate domains. Um, from the question of why use multimodal neuroimaging as opposed to any single modality, um, there's the obvious uh, point that essentially no single modality gives us complete information, um, but that really doesn't address the question of why you need to go through these exotic things like simultaneity um, for your multimodal approaches. Um, and uh, the other kind of motivations for looking for multimodal tools are the possibility that there is actually some sort of um, information sharing across the modalities beyond just that I read it in one paper and I read it in another paper uh, which we're using two different modalities. Um, and the simultaneity of acquisition with multimodal tools offers us to a certain extent the possibility to probe things in uh, both space and time and answer both basic neuroscience questions and clinical questions. The how questions um, for these kinds of things are really dominated by technical issues um, a lot of them are uh, mutual interference between the various devices that might be involved. I'll only speak to several of these. I'm sure that many speakers will speak to others. But um, when you take things like Simon Cherry's um, incredible uh, work in trying to put a PET scanner inside an MRI machine, um, you can kind of imagine the extent to which these hardware issues are really serious problems. Um, for most of the work that I'm going to talk about today, the problems are mostly ones of signal interference. Um, and then, of course, um, it's not just looking at the same results from two different cameras at the same time that gives you your information. It's some level of information sharing at the analytic end that's going to offer you any advantage for these kinds of joint uh, acquisitions. Um, so I was um, asked to speak to a clinical question. The video isn't really um, coming through very well on the screen here, but um, I want to talk to you today about epilepsy. Um, epilepsy is a disease which is surprisingly common. I, I would say offhand that everybody listening here knows somebody with the disease um, because its penetrance in the population is between 1% and 3%, depending on who you ask. Um, and it's a very debilitating disorder, um, which is characterized in many cases by grand mal-type seizures, um, which look a great deal like what you're seeing on the screen here. Um, they're not quite as jittery necessarily. Um, and um, it turns out that there are a lot of serious problems with epilepsy. Um, one of them is diagnostics. Um, this individual is indeed having a seizure but does not have epilepsy. Um, this is a phenomenon known as psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Um, and uh, PNES is really understood largely to be a conversion disorder, something that has more of a psychiatric slash psychological basis than full-blown uh, organic epilepsy. But it, these um, PNES things are really quite common. Um, and uh, when you try to treat people with epilepsy, you end up, obviously, the PNES people are very unlikely to be responding to the normal drug medications that might work well in people who have organic disorders. Um, but even in the people with organic disorders, the tools that are available to the clinician in order to treat disease are really relatively poor and limited. Um, in fact, I think the word I would choose is blunt. Um, uh, in a wild type people coming in with seizure disorder, um, you can see that by the time you've gone through a, a exhaustive treatment trying multiple drugs, you still have in the order of uh, three quarters of these individuals who are not seizure free after having put on, being put on these wild and, and actually in fact, kind of poisonous drugs. The drugs that are available to treat the disease are really, in general, pretty ugly. Um, and 
when you look at the entries into the clinic, uh, we studied this with 1,300 people entering our seizure disorder center at UCLA, um, something on the order of a quarter of the people who come into the clinic have uh, epileptic type seizures of non-epileptic origin. Um, and when these people are then referred to follow up and treatment, we'll just pay attention to the middle line on there. Uh, in this case, we, we um, gathered 100 people, 170 people who were being set up for surgery, and 6% of those were ultimately found out to have uh, seizures of non-organic uh, nature, which is to say these are one in 20 people who are having brain surgery done um, for something which is clearly not going to be treatable with brain surgery and clearly is going to have associated morbidity. So uh, I hope that motivates the reason why I might spend a little time on this disease. Um, it turns out to be a really interesting disease as well, which of course all things are. Um, one of the issues in uh, epilepsy is that um, in fact it's very hard to detect other than these overt behaviors, um, at least when people are not actually having the seizures. Um, these are kind of typical scans that might show up for somebody with temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, this is both a PET and an MRI study on here. And the arrow points to, to the lesion. However, I'm not skilled enough after having looked at several thousand of these to be able to detect anything from either of these exams. Um, in, in fact, what happens when patients go in for referral after imaging, they almost end, always end up in a, a clinical conference where the clinicians discuss among themselves, you know, kind of vote. Well, I think take out the right side, and somebody goes, well, I think take out the left side. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of ugly in there. So we have a huge diagnostic challenge. Um, when you look at the accuracy of diagnostics based on, um, on uh, uh, in this case, PET and MRI, you find that in the people who are medication resistant, the accuracy of the diagnostics all told around about 60%. Um, there is somewhat better catchment for people who have the most common location for epilepsy, which is in the medial temporal lobe. Um, it's not too surprising. Everybody knows where to look. Um, and there's a great deal of symmetry in the temporal lobe, which offers you some advantage in trying to look at the images, which doesn't exist if you have a cortical neoplasia someplace random on the brain. Um, so we, we started getting our feet wet in this, oops, I guess one of my images is showing up, right over here on the left-hand side where it says interictal pet is a nice luridly colored pet, pet scan, but you can't see it. Um, <laughs> I see Aina squinting to try and find the empty piece. Um, so um, we started looking at the possibility of doing automated diagnostics using computer-aided uh, um, systems here, or CADs. Um, and this is my student, Wesley Kerr, who uh, took the interictal PET, in, in, interictal means between seizures, took the interictal PET scan, um, ran them through a tool called NeuroQ, which goes ahead and segments the brain automatically into ROIs. He captured the um, nominal activity in the PET scan in each of those ROIs, then uh, used a relatively classical um, machine learning uh, pre-processing um, tool called minimum redundancy, maximum relevancy, in order to sort the features from these ROIs, and then ran the tool through multi-layer perceptron uh, to try and identify um, from the PET scans automatically what was going on. Oh, there's my PET scan that just showed up. Nice. Um, the, the bottom line here is that the computer-aided diagnostics, which are shown in the lurid green um, uh, colors over here, in general matched or beat the clinician, um, which was nice and encouraging. And it gave us the, the, um, the hope that there might be some possibility to go ahead and use these machine tools to deal with the problem of multimodal um, comparisons. Um, we actually did that. And um, in looking at the PET and the MRI data, one of the interesting things that showed up is the shared information between the PET and the MRI was in general relatively low. Um, and the machine was able to look at things from both uh, PET and the MRI and uh, was, was identifying features that were separable in the two scans. That's important. That's one of the things that you might use to justify the general notion of multimodal imaging. If one tool shows one set of data and another tool shows the same set of data in different colors, who cares? Um, all right, so most of you uh, will recognize that epilepsy is, is 
actually identified by uh, electrical disorders in the brain, um, uh, which tend to be very, very large discharges, um, which if you're lucky, show up over the lesion that might be causing the disease. Um, we're very seldom so lucky because a great deal of epilepsy takes place in the medial temporal lobe, as I mentioned. Uh, but especially when you have neocortical epilepsies, you can sometimes identify the seizure focus from the EEG alone. Um, so this kind of motivates my general issue in, in multimodal neuroimaging. Um, as Carl Lashley said, the classical concept of cerebral localization is of limited value because, because of its static character and its failure to provide any answers to the question of how specialized parts of the cortex interact to produce the integration evidence in thought or behavior. The problem here is one of the dynamic relations of the diverse parts of the cortex, whether they be cells or cortical fields, okay? So basically he's saying, forget just looking at bright blobs on PET. Um, we really need to understand brain dynamics in order to understand the brain. And of course, epilepsy is a highly dynamic disorder. Um, several years ago, we came up with a tool uh, in order to um, detect, uh, oh, I'm getting an echo. I can't play the audio from this, I guess. Okay, so um, this is uh, my colleague, Algisa Lenardovich, who is uh, collecting data simultaneously in the MRI and on the EEG. The screen there shows the interference from the MRI camera when we are actually scanning, and it shows up badly in the EEG. Uh, we came up with a fun algorithm and a bunch of hardware which takes care of this um, very, very effectively, and you can see um, the screen updating there as it removes the artifacts in real time while we're uh, collecting the EEG data. Um, and I guess that uh, NIH offers now courses in similar stuff here, so that's very exciting. Um, and the EEG once processed actually looks you know, remarkably good, remarkably like you weren't scanning at all. Um, all right, so um, why the EEG and where could we go with that? Well, we also tried looking at um, machine uh, tools in order to analyze the EEG alone. Um, and in this case, uh, um, again, same student uh, who's now a clinician at UCLA, Wesley Kerr, um, looked at spectral analysis of the EEG, separating the EEG into 100 one hertz wide bands, and then going through a similar procedure to what you saw for the PET CAD tool, um, uh, prioritizing features and uh, using a opaque tool, the multi-layer perceptron, in order to uh, do diagnostics. And uh, essentially what happens here, we concentrate on this uh, lower right, um, if a person has uh, only one abnormal uh, EEG, um, the uh, likelihood ratio of catching the disease is uh, like one in a hundred. Um, when you uh, go ahead and um, look at people who are uh, um, who show up as no disease after our computer-aided diagnostics. The likelihood ratio has improved dramatically, um, and likewise, um, if you have uh, had positive diagnostics, we have a very, very good likelihood of catching the people with the disease using the EEG alone. Um, so, how about this no no notion of uh, collecting the two together? Um, and how am I doing for time here? Because we got kind of a late start and I'm trying to talk fast. Okay, great, I'll do my best. Um, with any of these multimodal tools, we consider the problem of whether or not the information that's generated by the underlying phenomenon, either a pathology or some neural event that we're interested in, is actually visible to both of the modalities in some way that's different. And um, the hope is that there's a, a relatively large region, in fact, where we're getting separate information from our two tools, in this case EEG and MRI, and hopefully some layer of shared information which gives us hope that we're looking at the same process um, at the very minimum. Um, I'm trying to advance the slide, okay. Um, so this is uh, now epilepsy, um, and hopefully is this running? I can't see if it's running. Here we go, so it's a little movie. Um, what we did is look at the spikes that occurred during seizures, and then collected MRI images um, uh, uh, at rapid rate immediately following those spikes, and then uh, ran these things through a um, general linear model analysis to go to detect brain activity changes. And these are, in fact, sped up about two or three times. The uh, fMRI changes in the brain following um, the sorted spikes on here. 
And this was very, very encouraging because, in fact, what these things tended to do is, fo is point to the idea of focality in this individual brain. Um, I am sorry to say that we get this nice, exciting result rarely, maybe one in 10 people, um, where there's a good chance that the interictal spikes are definitive for identifying the localization. Um, and so this is really not part of our ordinary clinical regimen right now. It's disappointing, um, but there you have it. Um, part of this has to do with um, the extent to which these uh, spikes might actually have some sort of common marker that should appear in the fMRI. That is, are the spikes themselves of high enough magnitude to mount a metabolic response in the brain? Brain signaling turns out to not cost a lot of energy. Um, and I want to spend a little time on that question. Um, ever since the, e, the human EEG was discovered at the turn of the century, um, people have noticed that when their human subjects or patients close their eyes, um, there's often a very prominent signal that appears in the EEG, which looks like a kind of sinusoidal cycle, uh, cycling at about 10 hertz. Um, because it was the first one discovered, it has the clever nomenclature alpha rhythm. Um, beta, they discovered somewhat later, and you can guess what goes from there. Um, and uh, the alpha rhythm is so prominent that, in fact, uh, how many, I just want to make sure people WebEx can't see this. How many people in the room use EEG? Okay, all right. So basically everybody in the room knows this. The way you test whether the leads are on properly is you ask the subject to close their eyes because everything else in the EEG looks like noise, right? You can't tell whether the electrodes are attached unless it's AC cycle noise most of the time, but, th but this is a good and prominent feature in the EEG. So this is one of the first things we spent time studying once we built this EEG fMRI machine. And I want to talk a little bit about w why and how you might see something here. Um, in general, um, you're just looking at electrical potentials in the brain, and it's reasonable to assume that they superpose linearly. Um, the the uh, activity in the brain consists of stuff which is simultaneous activity among multiple neurons or columns or whatever it is that's generating this thing, as well as asynchronous activity, that is, things that these neural elements are doing separately. And the synchronous activity should, as long as the stuff is in phase, appear additive and produce a nice high magnitude signal, whereas the asynchronous activity is effectively random, and so I'm going to guess that you look like something like the, the sort of square root of the activity, sort of an RMS kind of function in there, um, whereas the bold, electrically, whereas the bold signal, if each of these events are energetically equivalent, the bold signal should see the sum of those two. So they have very, very different sensitivities for synchronous and asynchronous activity. Um, and then there's the question about really what energies are involved anyway, and I'm sorry that the bottom of the screen is going to be blocked out a little bit here. Um, you get these high amplitude waveforms like alpha, presumably because a bunch of neurons are doing something or other at the same time. You can't possibly see a single neuron from the scalp. Um, so you're looking at millions of units um, that must be superposing on here. So how does this phenomenon occur? Well, one possibility is that um, there is some sort of a clock inside the brain which is ticking at 10 hertz, which is multiply connected to, say, several million neurons, um, and that this forces all of these neurons to fire in synchrony, generating these large waveforms, right? Perfectly sensible hypothesis. Um, the term millions is nothing in the brain. It's, it's great, right? You, you, you can do this. Um, this model would presume that, in fact, driving a synchronous rhythm like alpha is extremely costly from an energetic perspective because every one of those synchronizing neurons must be receiving some sort of synaptic drive um, in order to do this. So this model would predict that when you have high amplitude alpha waves, you would see a high amplitude response to the metabolic tool like fMRI. Um, if the neurons are firing at random with respect to one another, um, then you certainly shouldn't expect any particularly high amplitude activity in the MRI because those neurons are really um, not associated with any, you know, major activity. Um, 
Another possibility is that the neurons themselves are, tend to self-oscillate, and they tend to self-oscillate at something close to the same frequency. One of the nice features that's well known about simple oscillators is that if there's any coupling at all between the oscillators, they tend to force themselves into synchrony. Um, the classic example, and I, I've, now, I've now heard that in fact it's somewhat discredited, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, um, is that women in um, dorms tend to have their periods at the same time. At least that, that's been the traditional report. I don't know what happened here, um, but I don't have a screen. Oh, and, and, uh, I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, great. Um, that being the case, you could imagine, in fact, the neurons tend to self-synchronize through very, very low amplitude coupling between the, the multiple neurons, in which case you would expect that uh, the MRI signal would actually be minimal associated with these oscillations. So let's kind of look at results. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, on the other hand, if you have neurons which, are, which remain loosely coupled and tend to self-oscillate, but then you try to do something purposive with them, say you, you end up with some sort of ascending drive from thalamus to the neurons that's responsive to a stimulus, then what you're going to do is drive these neurons out of synchrony. It takes very little to do that. And again, because now this is a positive event at the synaptic level, the expectation is that disrupting the alpha rhythm should go ahead and, and increase the metabolic markers in the brain. Um, so all of this is a little bit post hoc for what the original findings were um, when we did this experiment a couple decades ago, gosh, um, where uh, now what we've got are, are the familiar bold fMRI pseudo-metabolic map showing uh, positive signal changes in red and signal decreases in blue associated with the power uh, fluctuations in the alpha band of the EEG. And what's very clearly the case is the occipital portions of the brain, which for those of you who don't know, is the back of the head, shown on the bottom of the screen here, um, tend to decrease in the signal, whereas the central regions of the brain, for example, the posterior portions of the thalamus, a good, a good powerful visual relay area, um, shows a positive increase, that is, its signal increases as alpha goes up. Um, this is all pretty interesting because, in fact, what it is kind of suggesting is uh, that the process of generating alpha is a low metabolic activity phenomenon. This is very, very different than the traditional theories of the sources of alpha generation. Traditional electrical only theories from people like Laurenti Deneau um, suggested that there's a, an electrical oscillation between these central thalamic regions and the occipital uh, brain regions. Um, and this strongly suggests otherwise. And I also, I guess, have to point out parenthetically um, that alpha power is best seen at the back of the head over the occipital lobe, particularly alpha associated with closing your eyes, right? So all of this kind of suggests that, that alpha is a spontaneous self-organizing rhythm that self-organizes probably at the level of the cortex. Um, we did one other interesting series of experiments um, I guess there were other interesting ones. This, this, is, this is an interesting one, um, where uh, my student, uh, Sha Hong Jing, um, looked at the fMRI signal with respect to the onset of the alpha bursts on here. And interestingly, um, the uh, occipital signal um, in the MRI occurred uh, several seconds later um, than it did within the thalamus. Um, and again, these are kind of suggestive of separate generative events uh, where whatever is driving the thalamus um, is actually decreasing its drive onto cortex. I'm afraid that hasn't been published. We never got around to anything other than the conference with that. Um, okay, so I, I want to say a, a few words about um, event-related uh, EEG rather than these um, uh, oscillatory things. And I'm going to use as an example some experience, uh, experiments we did building a lie detector, and I'm not going to tell you about the lie detector here, although I'd love to. It's off topic. Um, but effectively, um, we compared the uh, signal intensity in the brain when people were uh, uh, believed what they were saying or didn't believe what they were saying. 
and you end up with these um, contrast maps, which are familiar to people who do fMRI. And people who do fMRI would tend to do a certain amount of tea leaf reading for this and explain that this is somehow, you know, some function associated with every yellow blob here. I don't care for the moment. Um, but what I wanted to show here is that it's nominated several regions. Um, in my lab, we got interested in the idea of decomposing these signals by uh, into regions um, found independently by independent components analysis and factoring these things into for the use in classifiers. Again, have more to do with the lie detectors than anything else, but I want you to see the regions from the various components that were uh, discovered by MRMR to be most significant. Um, these data from Pamela Douglas um, showed, so, so let me go back to the experiment a little bit. We present the subject with a statement and they assert with a button press whether or not they believe that statement to be true. So each of these events comes every couple of seconds, and therefore we have a bunch of events in the brain which have been labeled um, as being true or not true by the subject, and we can there, there, therefore go ahead and sort the images um, every several seconds for whether this is a belief or a disbelief condition, and we can average the MRI responses, we can also look at the EEG responses that follow that. So what you're going to see here on the bottom left is a uh, topology of the electrical signal. On the bottom right, um, we're going to see the electrical signal played out onto a flattened cortex. And in the middle right, we're going to see the electrical signal superimposed in um, source localization space. And the top shows what I showed you before, which are the regions which nominated themselves in general linear model analysis for the fMRI alone. Um, and what's very, very apparent from these data are that the self-same regions show up in the EEG source mapping as did in the MRI. That was very, very exciting um, because it suggests that, in fact, the neural events associated with at least this kind of signaling are co-localized by the two technologies. And this offers us, therefore, the possibility to imagine, in fact, these are the same events, which we are seeing two different uh, representations of. Um, for the lie detector, what we went ahead and said is, based on the MRI alone, can we determine whether or not the person believed or disbelieved each individual statement? Um, the computer uh, had the labels, but it really didn't know anything other than that. So the computer goes ahead and sorts it. We get about 80% accuracy about whether people believe or disbelieve individual statements um, using the MRI alone. Using the EEG, interestingly, you end up with almost the same kind of accuracy. And in this particular case, we did a relatively simple spectral analysis of the EEG, and uh, the, the graph panel here is showing us the um, the uh, computer-generated uh, responses for sorting these data. Okay, so then there comes this interesting challenge of how you're going to go ahead and use both of these pieces of information. Are they really going to offer you better, um, better knowledge of what's going on inside the subject's head than one uh, component alone? And I am sorry to tell you, as of this date, we don't have that answer for the EEG fMRI data for this experiment. Um, but that's one of the major issues in the lab is trying to find smart ways to combine uh, technologies like these. Um, I have only a single slide here on this topic, and I'm doing it simply because it's an area I'm per currently interested in. Um, these data are relatively new, um, and these are a totally different combination of things. We're looking at functional MRI not with EEG, but functional MRI with low-intensity focused ultrasound. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, ultrasound uh, broad, uh, sent into the brain seems to alter the activity of neurons um, during the time that the ultrasonic pulses are present. And uh, we have seen this phenomenon in several cases. One of them, I couldn't find the slide to get it in here this morning. One of them actually shows that life up will interrupt epileptic seizures um, at least in animal models, um, if applied at the right time. Therefore, the reason it wants to be in this slide set, I, I wish I had that picture to show you. Here what's happening is we're showing you the bold MRI um, signal changes associated with, um, with these ultrasonications in the brain. And um, one of the nice features we see here is, in fact, at least a, a, um, 
stimulus intensity dependent effect on the brain projecting this is in fact a real phenomenon. Um, this turned out to be a relatively easy integration. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about tech in a moment, but um, LifeUp devices use piezoelectric uh, transducers, which you can just shove inside any magnet and with very minimal uh, fuss, we were able to go ahead and do this as a simultaneous experiment. The biggest problem is bulk. You know, you've got this big old transducer that goes inside a tiny little head coil. Um, I want to talk about uh, yet another phenomenon then um, with uh, brain stimulation, um, and this is the so-called perturbational complexity index. This is an area I'm working on actively with a, with a wonderful team um, uh, who are studying the possibility that brain responses to transient stimulation can become markers for consciousness. And the PCI is thought by this group to actually be a marker for whether or not the brain is conscious. And the general idea is that if you imagine the brain to be a collection of uh, neural elements, each of which is multiply connected to one another, if, um, if that system has the right level of integration across units without being so heavily connected that the responses of these multiple units together become trivial, um, that you end up with a system uh, where capable of producing what we're going to call integrated information. The idea of the, which is the conscious state. Um, the idea of the PCI is that you should be able to probe this system by disrupting the neurons transiently and looking at the responses that come from it. It's effectively kind of an evoked response uh, phenomenon. And if you have a brain which is poorly connected, at least at that moment, what will happen is a, a brief stimulus into uh, Cursor is really small. Um, if you have a brief stimulus, uh, oh, I, I've got this incredible tool here, which nobody can see at home. Um, signing it myself. Okay, so um, if you do a brief uh, pulse into a single region, if the brain is relatively disconnected, um, the units are relatively disconnected, you get a transient response only from those neurons to which you're directly stimulating. On the other hand, if you have uh, a system which is so tightly integrated that the, all the neurons are forced to fire at the same time, you end up with trivial excitation um, uh, involving all the neurons of the brain. Whereas in this magic state of integrated information, you get a much more complex set of dynamic responses in the brain. Um, the PCI is derived then from using a large high amplitude disruptive pulse from transcranial magnetostimulation, TMS, um, which then uh, produces a set of electrical responses in the brain, which we record, we sort, we do some magic to, and end up with a number, um, which is the so-called PCI, the perturb perturbational complexity index. And it's measured from multiple electrodes, which therefore are intended to be sampling different regions of the brain, which might be uh, connected and dynamic and interesting in time. Um, what's interesting about the PC, well, many things, but one thing that's very interesting about the PCI is that whether or not you believe this idea about integrated information, um, the responses do tend to sort very, very nicely with anybody's expectation about what conscious and unconscious is going to look like in the brain. Um, so in this particular case, um, this is work by, uh, for Massimini's group, uh, Casaroto was the first author, um, showing that as a function of uh, co it measures cognitive state, in this case um, for impaired states, um, what happens is the PCI is reliably higher um, for people who are conscious and responsive than for people who are not conscious and non-responsive. And uh, these kinds of experiments have been repeated in anesthetic conditions, under with hallucinatory drugs, in sleep, and a variety of other things, and they sort very nicely. So this has been actually a pretty promising tool. Um, I'm bringing it up here solely because I'm very much involved now in the technology of building these things. And um, if you think MRI gradients are a problem, try and do TMS. Um, and I know that people are doing work similar to this here. Um, TMS produces very, very high uh, rates of changing magnetic field locally in the magnet. Um, it produces enormous problems in the, uh, in the EEG. 
And the EEG is heavily contaminated, therefore, by not only the TMS that pulse itself, but then by a variety of other long-lasting art, um, artifacts. For example, um, you depolarize the skin enough that there are time constants associated with the energy storage in the skin, capacitance, which go, go and ring down for milliseconds in there. We have time constants in the electrodes themselves, which ring down for milliseconds. We have muscle artifacts. We have a billion things that are in there. Um, and so um, I'm not presenting you the solution to this problem because, in fact, although I'm pretty confident that I've got what I want, it's not ready for uh, prime time in here. But in general, we're able to do a pretty good job of reducing these artifacts electronically and automatically. Um, and uh, so uh, stay tuned for what those answers are going to look like. Um, okay. Uh, how much time? Okay, great. That's so I'll uh, hopefully we'll finish up quickly with these last couple thoughts. Um, I want to sort of cycle back now to our oscillatory behaviors in the brain. Um, the brain at at uh, under normal conditions produces very complex sets of responses. Different by di these are I don't know a dozen different electrodes on the brain showing um, the degree to which the information that are both uh, are both shared common information and are different, um, and then once a seizure starts in the brain, an epileptic seizure, what happens is that the brain falls into an incredibly stereotyped set of responses where you can just take this waveform and repeat it over and over and over again. Um, and it'll do this and grab, in a, in, a, in a grand mal seizure, the whole brain and force it into synchrony with this. Um, this is a, I mean, besides it being a, a clinically terrible phenomenon, it's also a bizarre thing that the brain should do this. And so I want to think a little bit about why this happens. But, you know, the brain does this a lot. Um, if you consider the algorithm, this is a case where you have wholesale, uh, wholesale and broad synchronization of activity in the brain in multiple regions. Um, uh, this is kreutzfeldt jakob disease, um, another disease which is associated with a highly stereotypic very low information um, set of waveforms, which are cyclic. Um, Parkinson's disease, another disease, un unfortunately, uh, well, in, in, for Parkinson's, one of the leading symptoms is a tremor at resting state. It's very hard to see that tremor from within the brain except with, with depth electrodes. So I'm showing you here from the um, uh, EMG recordings. But again, it's an electrically driven thing that, that's the brain self-oscillating. So my final question here is, why would you build a machine that self-oscillates? What's the brain doing that might make this part of its ordinary process? Um, and I want to think about um, the notion that um, any of these electrical oscillations that we pick up is actually the, um, the combined effect of many, many processes in many regions of the brain all of which have a variety of parameters which are going to co-vary in order to produce a single oscillation. That sounded awfully big wordy. Um, if you go ahead and uh, look at the Hodgkin-Huxley model of neurons and you apply a small depolarizing current onto the neurons, you'll find the neurons tend to self-oscillate. Okay. But most people here know the Hodgkin-Huxley model. If they don't know, know it by heart, they know that it contains about a dozen um, state variables in it. And so you kind of think about all of those state variables describing some set of cycles on their own, which superpose in some complicated way to get to this electrical signal. I hope that made sense. Um, I want to think about that in some kind of different mode. Um, this is a kind of an abstract thought, and it's my final one for you today. Um, why should the brain self-oscillate? What's going on in here? And I would say that one of the features of our brain which is really most interesting is the idea is that we can task switch between different operations of the brain with incredible alacrity. We could, for example, carry a thought for quite a long time and then it gets interrupted and becomes something else. Um, on the other hand, if we carry a thought for too long, we end up with a disease like obsessive compulsive disorder. People get brain stuck. Um, and this is a feature of the information processing of the brain, that it actually has to be able to find low energy, that's what this sort of hilly diagram is supposed to suggest, low energy states that capture our, let's call
call it attention, um, uh, for long enough to be able to actually go and work on a problem, and then we have to have some means by which we can get ourselves out of those locked states, because otherwise what happens is the brain becomes a stupid machine that's as, as electrically interesting as the heart. It just goes blump, 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 and doesn't actually do any information work. Um, so <clears throat> I would claim that one of the features of the organizing principles of the brain is in fact it actually has to be built in order to have these catchy low energy states in order to do anything that looks at all like information processing. A feature of a diseased brain, however, might be either that these energy wells themselves are too low for anything to get themselves out of, and I think that that's probably what's going on in disease like epilepsy, or um, that there is somehow so much quieting of activity of the brain that you can't pop yourself out in, kind of, in sort of a noise generation sense from any of these energy wells to find yourself anyplace else. Um, and with that, I, I guess um, it's going to go dark, it's fine. Um, I, my closing thought on that might be that, um, again, whatever you have to say about the perturbational complexity index, it speaks very well to this question about the idea of a brain which is self-oscillatory when it has these, um, when it's capable of supporting things like conscious states um, and produces non-trivial responses when driven, uh, whereas uh, in trivial or more trivial states like slow wave non-dreaming sleep, the brain is self-organizing in such a way that you cannot go ahead and have this sort of smooth movement between different internal so uh, that's all I have to say, and I guess there's a, a couple minutes for questions, even with a late start, right? Yeah. Great. Okay, good. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Do I have minutes to do that? I have slides queued up. Uh, the question was, how do you get rid of artifacts in EEG and MRI? Um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so one idea might be that you, here's a nice high resolution picture of the artifacts of the upper left. Um, and uh, this is the activity associated with gradients in an echo planar scan. Um, one approach might be to go ahead and say, well, let's just filter it in the classical sense of filtering where I turn down the treble knob on my stereo to the point that I can't hear the symbols, you know? Um, and uh, that kind of spectral filtering does not work, unfortunately, for the EEG, um, be, uh, for the MRI EEG artifact, because in fact the artifact is in the same spectral bands that you're interested in. You do this kind of spectral filter to get rid of the radio frequency artifacts. This isn't enough. Um, so our general approach to getting rid of artifacts in the MRI is to assume that what we receive from the head um, is um, a signal which contains uh, the EEG and the artifacts superposed linearly onto it. Um, and that we can, if the artifact is the same each time, we can model it by simply averaging the artifacts and under the assumption that the, that the ongoing EEG is not itself synchronized by the artifact, um, what happens is that you should be able to subtract the artifact from the uh, combined signal, and that's it. You get EEG alone. And, it, of course, it works perfectly, as you can see, because you receive EEG alone, as, as it shows in my equation. Uh, unfortunately, however, um, the assumption is that, number one, the EEG and the artifact have to be 100% uncorrelated, and guess what? They're not. Um, and we throw that under the rug. We get, we get an evoked response every time the scanner goes beep. Um, and we, as, as it happens, throw away that evoked response. Um, secondly, we make the assumption that the EEG and the artifact are linearly superposed. That actually is a relatively high demand on the amplification system. And finally, we assume that the artifact is, in fact, identical each time, that every time the scanner goes beep, the same thing happens in the EEG. It's the latter problem that ends up being difficult. Um, am I okay going a little over here? Okay. Um, so uh, again, this is now the um, uh, EEG signal blown up to a very high degree of resolution. We're sampling at 10,000 hertz with this. Um, and here we have simply uh, on the top row uh, is the artifact you saw before with the average removed. And it looks kind of more or less okay. We have a little bit of problem at the onset and offset. Um, 
But in fact, if we zoom in on the EEG in these portions where the gradients are firing at a very high rate, um, lo and behold, the, still see the gradient activity in there after all of this um, averaging and subtracting. And this was troubling um, and spent a lot of time scratching my head until I went to sleep one morning and woke up with the solution. And the solution is kind of fun. Um, it has to do with the fact that the gradient artifacts do not, in fact, appear identically every time that the gradients fire. And the reason for that is that the EEG activity is sampled digitally using an A to D converter, which is moving along at, say, 10,000 times per second, and collects the actual analog signal as a series of numbers representing voltage over time. Um, and this happens to have been acquired, uh, I, I guess, I acquired this one at 5,000 hertz or simulated it at 5,000 hertz. And so you could see that our average of the artifacts would be now the sum of the regions uh, here and here, okay? Um, and if we go ahead and look at that, because the EEG is not sampled identically compared to the timing of the gradients each time, every time we get an EEG, um, it's going to look a little different from, from the gradients. And if we then go ahead and, and look at the difference from one cycle to the next, what you find is that you still have residuals because of the fact that there's a phase shift between the sample points. Am I making sense here? Okay. Once you've thought about that, it turns out that the answer just drops out. You say, let's get rid of the phase shift. And what you do is you now force the EEG system to sample in synchrony with the MRI clock. So every time the gradient pulse is fired, the EEG ADC system is synchronized with it in which case the artifact appears identically each time, and uh, therefore the sum um, looks the same, and you can subtract out the signal perfectly. Okay? Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, and you can see I'm sampling at this very high rate. If people, if people don't know the Nyquist criterion briefly, the idea is that if you want to capture EEG signals up to a certain frequency, you have to run your ADC system at minimal double that frequency in order to collect that frequency. Um, the ICUS criterion, by the way, is 100% completely true, except up to some bizarre limit having to do with Planck constants, but it turns out to be useless um, because the assumption building the Nyquist, coming up with the Nyquist formula is that you have sampled the signal for infinite time. If you don't sample for infinite time, then in fact the Nyquist threshold of two times the, the maximum frequency is no longer relevant or no longer correct. Um, that being said, Nyquist we can throw away. I don't have to sample the signal rapidly at all in order to do this trick. In fact, I can sample the signal at the casual rate usually used for EEG, which is on the order of 200 times a second, even though the MRI artifact is at frequencies multiples of that. If the MRI artifact is in the order of 1,000 hertz, um, you can still represent it completely accurately with a very, very low sampling rate, which turns out to unburden the problem of doing MRI EEG massively. Getting very, very fast, very high resolution uh, ADC systems is a non-trivial problem. Um, and the, you can prove um, that the magnitude of the artifact falls effectively linearly with the phase error um, on here, and this relatively simple formulation suggests that. No reason going through it, um, other than to say that as long as the, um, the uh, phase error is kept very small, you can remove the artifact. You can also suppress the artifact by acquiring it at higher and higher and higher frequencies, um, because those higher frequencies effectively amount to smaller phase errors in the signal. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest. It's just hardware for that. But I hope that answered the question. Okay. Thank you. Back round of applause. I can unshare my computer somehow. Um, I assume that no more time is necessary. Great. Okay, good.